Hi everybody, welcome to another Chem Complete lecture and in today's topic I want to discuss carbocations and the role that they have in stereochemical outcomes. So one of the things that I found was most common when we started talking about substitution reactions and then the alkene reactions is that students would very often get confused as to whether one or two different products were coming out of a reaction and this is primarily when we're talking about it on a stereochemical basis so SN1 and SN2 are really good examples as to what we're talking about here so I want to go through an example of each of those and then we're going to look at carbocations and why they are so important based on their structure in terms of determining stereochemical outcomes so if I were to just make a very simple type of example here, okay, where I have, let's say, a hydrogen, I've got a leaving group, we'll go ahead and use bromine, uh, I've got a methyl group, right, and I've got an ethyl group, because we want to keep some chirality here, okay. So if this is an SN2 reaction where this is going to occur at the same time I end up taking a look at some sort of nucleophile coming in which we'll just represent as a general nucleophile with a minus charge and as this bromine leaves the nucleophile comes in right to displace it now the way that this occurs the nucleophile has to come in through a backside attack because of the sterics uh, associated with this reaction so because it's a backside attack it will always invert the stereochemistry hundred percent but what is important to consider when you're looking at something like this is that there was no carbocation present during the mechanism and we'll talk about why that's important in just a minute all right so if it did a backside attack what was originally in the front is now in the back and what was originally in the back is now in the front so if the leaving group was in the front the nucleophile is replacing that we would then see the nucleophile is in the back right and then we would have the hydrogen out front and then we would still have the other two portions over here with the methyl and the ethyl okay but we would get 100% inversion of the stereochemistry from where we started now in an SN1 it turns out and we'll go through the mechanism for that one uh, after we talk about carbocations because it involves a carbocation but it turns out that you get 50 percent inversion and then you also get 50 percent retention so clearly the presence of the carbocation is creating a situation where I'm not going to always do a backside attack which would lead to a hundred percent inversion so then the question is what is it about the carbocation that is causing this type of observation in our stereochemical outcomes so in order to do that we want to examine the structure and the geometry of carbocations so when we consider carbocations this is very important here carbocations are flat and they are planar they're sp2 hybrids and sp2 hybrids are trigonal planar in terms of their geometry and this is very very important because let's take the example that we had above if i have something that looks like this and the leaving group leaves right then I'm going to end up with a carbocation on this carbon here so the leaving group leaves and in an SN1 that's the rate limiting step the leaving group would leave and what you'd be left behind with okay notice that the dash and the wedge go away because there is no three-dimensional geometry as far as tetrahedral structure goes when you're dealing with a carbocation so this carbon has a carbocation right here okay now what is an actual carbocation well on a carbon the carbon has gone from an sp3 to an sp2 hybridized state 
And if it's sp2, that means it has an empty p orbital. Okay, so it still has these hybridized bonds right here. So we've got the CH2, the CH3, and then we've got the CH3 and the hydrogen. But right here, I'm going to put the plus here. This orbital is empty. There's an empty p orbital that is looking for some electrons to come in and to fill it. So these carbocations are very often intermediates. They do not stay as long-term products or some sort of ionic form that hangs out in solution. They are constantly looking for electrons to come in and fill that position. And that's exactly what the nucleophile would do in an SN1 reaction. Once the carbocation forms, the nucleophile would come in and would attack the carbocation, right? Now, why is it so important that the carbocation is flat and planar? Well, if you have something that is flat and planar, right? So imagine something like a sheet of paper. You can attack from a steric hindrance standpoint, right? Here are the uh, sort of substituents hanging out to the side here or something. You can attack from the top without any type of hindrance, and you can attack from the bottom without any type of hindrance. Okay? Or if you look at it as though it were a sheet that was set up this way, right? you could attack from the front of the sheet, or you could go ahead and go around back of the sheet and attack in that direction. So no matter which way you want to set up the trigonal planar geometry, you're dealing with a flat structure. And when you have a flat structure, you can attack from the top or the bottom, the front or the back, depending on how you're looking at the molecule. And it's usually going to be close to a 50-50 chance. And that's why we talk about 50% retention, 50% inversion. Now this leads to the term racemic mixture. And a racemic mixture is simply a mixture of two stereoisomers in equal amounts. Uh, so when we start talking about R and S, you're talking about that you've got a 50% R and a 50% S isomer in the solution. So let's take a look. Will, so will a carbocation intermediate always result in two stereoisomer products? Well, I've got two examples here. Let's run both of these examples through SN1 type of reactions and see what the answer is after we finish with that. So these are both going to have the bromine leaving. And after the bromine leaves, we are going to end up with our carbocation intermediate. So this one here is a tert-butyl type of structure. So I would have the three methyl groups. And the carbocation right there. And then for this one down here, it's a little bit larger but similar premise. The bromine leaves, I'm going to have my cyclic attachment here. Here's the carbon. And then I've got a methyl group here. Again, notice that the wedge and the dash portion goes away. That's another mistake that a lot of undergraduate students will make is they keep, because the CH3 is dashed up here, they'll keep it dashed down in this intermediate. That should not come back until you have some sort of a tetrahedral structure to assess. When you are dealing with trigonal planar, you should be flat, meaning all of the bonds should be just laid within the plane of the paper that you're drawing them on. Okay, so taking a look at these, we can then bring a nucleophile in. Again, it doesn't really matter. We can just use a generalized nuke that we're bringing in here. Okay? Because the purpose we want to assess here is stereochemical. So the nucleophile comes in. It could technically be coming in from the front or the back in each of these cases. So we know that we should be getting 50% retention and 50% inversion. All right, now let's take a look here. In terms of the products that would come out of this, we've got 
two potentials that we want to look at. So the first one would be that we could have the CH3, right, the carbon, and then for the retention, it would be where the nucleophile stays out front the same way that the bromine was. Okay. And then for the other one, we would have it where the nucleophile is in back. So now the nucleophile comes in back, and out in front is the methyl group, right? And then we've still got two other methyls. And then for the one down here, we would have our ring structure. I'm drawing a six-membered ring, should be five there. Okay, and again, in front, you could have the nucleophile for the retention. So this would be if it retained, keep the methyl in back, and then keep the ethyl out to the side. Plus, we could also get the opposite of that. So we could get, and notice it doesn't really matter where I'm drawing the ethyl and the ring structure portion here because they are both in the plane of the board. So we're really looking at what's changing in front and in back. Uh, and that's just in relation to like the RS orientation. So we could now have the nucleophile in back, right? And the methyl group up front. That would change the stereochemistry. And so here's the two that we have here. Now, this is important. If you look at this here, one of these examples does contain two products, the other does not. And you may be confused because we were able to draw out two for each of them. But the answer here is that these, this first set right here, this one and this one, those are the same. And that's because we do not have chirality around this carbon. So keep in mind when we start dealing with stereoisomers, we're dealing with chiral centers. And a chiral center has to be asymmetrical in all four of its substituents. You can't have any symmetry. Well, right here, we've got a methyl, another methyl, a third methyl. That is too many of the same substituent, and so therefore, these are really the same compound, because I can just flip it and turn it around to get the nucleophile in front, and it'll mirror exactly what I have here. Remember, they have to be non-superimposable when we're dealing with chirality and stereochemistry. So when I come down here, I've got the ring portion, that would be one. I've got a nucleophile, right, as a second thing. I've got the methyl as the third thing, and then I've got an ethyl group as the fourth thing here. So now that I have four different various items, right, that means that I have chirality, and therefore these would be two unique products, and so I would get two here, whereas I would have had one up above and hopefully that makes sense here okay chirality is very important and I also should mention so people don't get confused here when I was numbering these um, th this is not the correct numbering for R and S I was just showing you four different various values I wasn't going through the uh, Ingold rules where you actually are labeling and ranking the priorities there okay so You've got one up here because of the lack of chirality, meaning these are superimposable. I can rotate them and drag them over top of one another. And then down here for number two, right, these are non-superimposable, meaning they are chiral, and therefore I would have two unique products that come out of this. Again, the important thing to take away here is that when a carbocation is present, you have a flat area that any incoming group can attack, which means you could have activity from the front of the molecule or the back of the molecule. And if that's the case, you always have the potential for two different products. Whether or not you actually have two products will depend on the chirality and the uniqueness of the carbon center that is being attacked. So that's about it for this material that I wanted to cover. Hopefully you guys found this useful. 
Uh, feel free to leave any likes or comments. I've been hard at work getting those courses ready for the summer. I'm going to be offering a free course each month on various topics, um, including substitution reactions, solving unknown compounds with NMR and IR. Um, so look forward to that, and I will see you guys for future lectures. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'll answer any comments, and I will see you guys soon.